This is not just a B2C play, right? In B2B, uh, if you're Rolls-Royce, you used to sell jet engines to uh, aircraft manufacturers or to, uh, uh, to airlines. Nowadays, you're not selling jet engines anymore. You sell power by the hour, right? Uh, so you're just selling a service. Now, it's basically a performance guarantee, and so you say, well, why couldn't they have had a performance guarantee before? Well, because performance guarantee depends on the maintenance, right? If I don't have good control over the maintenance, then I can't give you a performance guarantee. Nowadays, right, these jet engines basically generate gigabytes of data whenever they fly. Some of these jet engines can actually order their own replacement parts, so before uh, the, the plane is actually landing, right, the service team knows what to do. Now, that means that Rolls-Royce really is understanding more and more about this particular jet engine, and so they can come from a, let's say, uh, fixed maintenance cycle of every six months we have to replace this particular part to, we just replace it whenever it's needed, and that may be after five months or after seven months. But also, Rolls-Royce learns more and more about all the jet engines that this particular airline has bought from them. So now they can start optimizing, actually, the use of these engines, use of flight routing, and all of a sudden, the value proposition between Rolls-Royce and the airline is very different. Right? It's not just about, hey, I'm selling you a jet engine, but I'm helping you run your organization much more efficiently. Um, how could I have a connected strategy with a shoe, right? And indeed, my connection with Nike was only every one and a half years, and then the connection was really with uh, Foot Locker, right, where I would buy my shoes. Of course, nowadays, I'm not buying a shoe anymore. I'm buying a shoe with a chip. That chip talks to my cell phone. That cell phone connects me to my virtual running club, right? And all of a sudden, again, Nike understands way more about me. They understand when I use the product, how I use the product, and they might start to learn what I really want to do is to finish my first marathon. Hey, and if you can help me with that goal, again, we have a very different value proposition than I'm just selling you a shoe. Now, what all of this points out is quite often, this is business model innovation. Right? Technology, of course, enables all of these new ideas, but very rarely it's actually the companies who create these business models who develop also the technology. You know, they rely on the technologies out there, right? Uber did not develop cell phones, GPS, and Google Maps. Right? But they say, look, if we can tie these technologies together, all of a sudden we might be able to create a business model that can be quite disruptive. The example that really we really love most is this, right? It used to be you go to a Disney World or Disneyland, right, and that was your interaction, right? You have a ticket, you hand over your ticket. Nowadays, right, with a magic band, what happens? Right, first of all, your life as a visitor is much easier because you don't have to carry around your ticket and your fast pack ticket and your credit card and your hotel key, right? Everything is there on that, on that magic band. At the same time, though, it also allows Disney to run the parks more efficiently because now they know where people are in the park. They can direct you to attractions that have shorter queues. As a matter of fact, the way they talk about it is one of the problems they had was when they open up the park gates in the morning, it would take like two hours before the people would make it to that last attraction that's one and a half miles down in the park. So I basically have access capacity sitting there, right, for uh, two hours in the morning. Nowadays, if I can pre-program people's itineraries, I can jumpstart operations right away. So again, creates a better customer experience while allowing us more efficient operations. It also allows us to create, and we heard this word magic a couple of times this morning, really magical experiences, right? Because here you are, right, walking with your daughter, let's call her Beth, right? You walk with Beth through Disneyland, and here comes Jack Sparrow, right, in full dress. And he goes, hi, Beth, how are you? Now, that used to be a, a difficult experience to create, right? Usually there was someone hiding behind a bush, right? And you were telling them, look, right, um, Beth is coming around the corner in the morning, right? And that person would go on a two-way hand handy kind of to the character who plays uh, Jack Sparrow, right? And so now Jack Sparrow could say, hi, how are you, Beth? Now, right, since Beth is wearing her magic band, right, Jack Sparrow knows exactly who's coming, and so you can just simply go, hi, Beth, how are you? And he can continue and saying, oh, and Beth, you hopefully remember, right? We, we met last year in Anaheim because what he has is every interaction that Beth had with any character in any Disney world around the world. And he says, Beth, I'm really proud of you that you just made it through level nine of the Pirates of the Caribbean online video game. That was a really hard level and you made it great. Now for Beth, this is like the most magic day in her world, in her, in her life, right? She says, wow, I mean, Jack Sparrow knows my name, he remembers me and he's cheering me on in my video game. So she thinks this is magic, and you as a parent go, man, that's creepy. <laughs> and I think this is really, really important, right? Because all of these new technologies that we have, all this connectivity that we can create, very often 
is at this very fine line between magic and creepy. And we better really understand our customers. What kind of connectivity do they want? And customers will differ. Some people say, well, that was a magic experience. Others people will say that was very creepy. And even the same customer on different occasions might want to have different customer experiences, want to have offload more decisions to you or wants to make more decisions themselves, right? And we better figure this out. All right, so when we think about connected strategies, there are really two different parts to it. So if on the one hand, there is what we call the connected customer relationship. On the other hand, there is the connected delivery model, right? Because we have to also create these connected customer relationships at an affordable price, right? Again, something that, that came out very clearly this morning. And so if we do it however right, a good connected customer relationship drives up what we'd call the willingness to pay, right? Or the value that the customer perceives in the product or services that we provide to them. And on the other hand, if we do the connected delivery model right, we can do this actually at lower cost. Now, if you can increase customer willingness to pay or increase customers' uh, value while at the same time reducing cost, uh, that is what causes disruption, right? And so that's why we see this in a number of industry really creating big upheaval. So let me just tell you another story about sort of connected strategies in my own life. I actually like to cook. But what a pain, right? When I think about cooking, the first thing I do is I rifle through some magazines to find a, a recipe. Once I found my recipe, I go into my pantry to see what do I need, what do I need to buy, right? I go through my fridge so I fi can finally make my shopping list. Then I jump into my car, I drive to a supermarket, I walk down the aisles to find all the stuff. Of course, I can't find everything in that supermarket, so I have to go to another supermarket. I jump back into my car. <sighs> I'm already exhausted right before I get home and do the thing that I actually want to do, is the cooking, right? And then after I'm done, I have all these leftovers, right? It's always the cilantro, right? I just needed one sprig, right? And now <laughs> I have this cilantro rotting in my fridge, right? It's not a good experience. Now, Contrast that to what has happened in my life in the last two years, and that is every Saturday morning I get this, right? I get a box, right? And that box has two recipes in it and all the ingredients in exactly the right amounts that I need. Now, to me, the interesting thing here is that my happiness as a, as a customer is not just determined by what's in the box. Now, of course, it's helpful, right, that there's fairly good quality stuff in the box, but actually my happiness as a customer is because you've removed all of these other pain points in my life, right? And so again, coming back to what we heard this morning, right, really understanding customer pain points along this entire customer journey is so important because very often when we talk to managers and say, so what are the value drivers of your customers? Many managers immediately focus on the tangible and intangible aspects of their product. Right, it's faster, it's cheaper, it's right, kind of it's more reliable, it's more robust, it has more options. And all of that, of course, is important. But there might be many other pain points we can remove in the lives of a customer to really differentiate ourselves in the marketplace. So that's what makes me happy. Uh, on the other side, on the supply side, right, um, Blue Apron, HelloFresh, whoever they are, right, they re really kind of reshape the supply chain, right, taking out some of the intermediate steps. And so one of the biggest problems in grocery retail, particularly if you say Whole Foods, is this. How many avocados do I need to stock? Right, because these things rot at the same time I don't want to run out. Blue Apron, Blue Apron never runs out of avocados. Why? Because if they don't have avocados, it's asparagus on the menu this week. Here's another interesting point. If you understand your customers really well, once in a while you are able to, to redirect them to a solution that the customer is basically indifferent about but is way cheaper for you to provide at that particular time and moment. Right? If I'm a customer, I don't care really whether I go first on this ride or that ride at Disney World, but if there's a longer queue here, if you send me over there, that's fine with me. You don't have to build more capacity for that ride because we always have a line there. No, if you can just direct me, all of a sudden we solve the same problem at much lower cost. Now also makes the farmer happy, as this picture attests, right? Because right, they are selling entire crops now to Blue Apron, again, allowing them to run their farms more efficiently. So again, we have this idea about better performance on the customer side, lower cost. The way sometimes to think about this, there is this trade-off, of course, right? And we can think about this, there's sort of an efficiency frontier out here that shows us the existing trade-offs between customer happiness and fulfillment cost. And basically what connected strategies have done is effectively shifted out this frontier. So these trade-offs are still there, but they are at a very much higher level. So if you think again about grocery retail, right? We can maybe sort of plot this, you know, happiness on the customer happiness on the, uh, vertical axis, our fulfillment cost on the horizontal axis, and there's a trade-off, right? And so we have new various companies aligned on that particular trade-off line. 
And now what has happened, right? This entire frontier has shifted out, right? So I, as a customer, my happiness is sort of higher than if I had to go to a farmer's market because we've removed all of these other pain points. And presumably Blue Apron with some scale has lower fulfillment cost like per meal than the total cost of me driving to the farmer's market, the farmer driving to the farmer's market, we having a transaction, right? So we can create sort of a meal at a lower cost and actually at a higher happiness for me as a customer, right? And so you all know kind of various players trying to, you know, innovate in the space of grocery kind of to you know, increase again kind of the connectivity, use this data to drive efficiency and happiness of the customer. So let's talk a bit more about this connected customer relationship and actually similar to the you know, four Ds, I have four Rs, uh, um, which we really think is quite helpful to think through of how you build a customer relationship. So first we have to kind of recognize right, a need of a customer or help the customer recognize what need he or she has. Then we have to translate that information into knowing what is actually the best solution for that particular need and send out sort of a request for that particular solution. Then we as a company have to respond to this and hopefully we do this many, many times so we can learn over time, we repeat this transaction so we can become better over time in recognizing, requesting and responding. So let me tell you another little story. Uh, this may have happened to you, it certainly has happened to me. Here I am sitting at home trying to print out this really important document and my printer just tells me it ran out of ink. Okay, fine, so what to do? I guess it's back jumping into my car, right? So now I'm driving to an uh, office depot or right, some other retailer of uh, toner cartridges. Of course, now I'm wandering the long aisles of office depot to find the aisle that has the toner cartridges in it. So now what's the key question? Yeah, what printer do I have, right? Is it the JetPro 6978? Is it the 8710? They kind of look the same, but of course they have different cartridges, right? So I, I pray to the god of HP that I remember correctly, right, which it is. Uh, of course, now they only have the multi-pack. I just need a black, right? Okay, fine. So I grab the multi-pack. I go to the checkout counter, but it looks like this because it's back to school sale, yay. So, you know, 15 minutes later, I'm finally at the checkout counter, right? Now the question is, did I actually bring my wallet? Oh, no. Kind of now I'm scrounging on for some cash. I pay. I get back into my car. Of course, now traffic looks like this, right? So the, by the time I get home, it's dark, it's rainy. Again, not a good experience. <laughs> we would call this experience the by what we have customer experience. And I would argue many firms still operate in this, right? Here we are as a firm and we wait for you customer to come to us, having figured out what you want, and maybe we have what you want, if not too bad, right? And well, we have to get the multi-pack, you have to get this, right? And if we're out of stock, well, maybe come back tomorrow. By what we have, okay. So that's clearly not so good, we can probably improve upon that, right? So uh, a different experience would be something like, right, after you realize that you ran out of toner, right, you go online to your favorite retailer, you type in your printer model, up pops the right cartridge that you need to buy, right, and with one click you have ordered it, paid for it, and a couple of hours later it gets delivered to you. So we would call this kind of connected customer relationship a respond to desire connected customer experience, right? So here, a customer knows exactly what they want, right? I need a black toner for this particular printer right now. I need a car to take me from here to the airport right now. I need some accommodation next weekend in Chicago, right? So a customer knows exactly what they want, and now you would like to provide them like with a button that they can click and make the rest of that customer journey as frictionless as possible. Now, can we do this better? Yes. Right? Why do I have to go down and bend over to try to figure out what is the model number on my printer to type it in to figure out what the right cartridge is? You should know what printer I have because I bought the printer from you or I reordered toner from you before, right? So if I log into my online account, maybe the site can already suggest the right toner cartridge and they might say, hey, Nicola, isn't it time for you to reorder some paper as well? So we would call that a curated offering, connected customer experience, right? So as we're learning more and more about a customer, we can start to personalize custom tailor our offering to them, right? When I go to Netflix and say, mm, I'm in the mood for a comedy, and Netflix says, well, that's great, because you have 10,000 comedies, that's not helpful, right? But say, here are the five that you might like, and oh, by the way, there's some you may not even be aware of, because they just were newly released, right? So that's helpful. Now, the problem that neither curated offering nor respond to desire really solved was that I only became aware that I ran out of toner after I ran out of toner. Right, how about, given that I'm reordering toner every eight weeks, after seven weeks you could send me a notification. And oh, by the way, 
technical I once in a while, you should run that cleaning function on your printer. So we would call that a coach behavior, connected customer experience, right? Quite often, customers, patients want to do certain things, right? I want to take my medication, but I'm forgetful, right? I want to lose some weight, but oh, sticking to the diet is hard. I want to finish that marathon, but oh, it means like I have to run every day, right? So, you know, if you can nudge me, if you can help me achieve some of these goals, well, that's again, right, value that I have. Lastly, right, um, maybe the story goes like this, right? The doorbell rings and there's a guy from FedEx handing you a package and you find that's kind of odd because you don't recall having ordered anything, okay? You unpack the box and you find a set of cartridges for your printer, you walk back to your office, you start printing and your computer alerts you that's about to run out of toner, right? You didn't know your, to your printer was running out of toner, but your printer knew it was running out of toner, so why couldn't just the printer reorder toner itself? Right, and so we would call that automatic execution connected customer experiences. So now there is this continuous flow of information from the firm to you, and if you've given the firm the authority to deal with these problems, the firm will deal with these problems before you have even realized there was a problem in the first place. Now, one important point we make in our book is we certainly do not think this is always the best way for every customer in every instance. Right? When I sit in front of my TV, I do not think I want Netflix or Comcast to immediately start streaming something. Right? No, no, please give me some choice. Right? I like to have at least some choice of what I want to watch. Right? Don't assume that you know me so perfectly well. Right? And so understanding kind of the use cases for these different connected customer experiences is really important. And I think every company needs to have a whole array of these different connected customer experiences so that we can see which one works well for which customer in which occasion. So coming back to this idea about a customer journey, right? And I think this is, this is really important, that we're not just focusing on like the good and service that we're directly providing to the customer, but really understanding, and this comes back sort of to the pain points or to the uh, kind of value drivers that we heard earlier this morning. So if we take this example of my latent need is that, yeah, at some point, hopefully I will retire, and at that point, right, my income stream will be less, and I would like to live a good life still at that point. That's my latent need. That's on the very far left. So now the question is, when do I actually become aware of that need? It turns out customers are not always becoming aware of the needs at optimal times, right? If I'm 60, that's not the optimal time to become aware of my need or having to save for retirement, right? When I'm lying on the floor with a heart attack, that is not the best time to become aware of my need of my healthcare issues, right? Unfortunately, that's, for instance, how healthcare works, right? We wait for something really catastrophic to happen. Then we start, then we're becoming aware. So awareness of need is a potential pain point. Okay, so now I know I need to start saving for retirement, now the question is how, right? I mean, what are the options all out there? And there are a gazillion of options, right? From ETFs to index funds to bonds to uh, life insurance, right? There's so many options, and I probably don't know any of them, or not all of them. So if you help me looking for these options, now helping me deciding what is actually the best option for me, given my situation, now I know, okay, this is the kind of bundle of products that I, I need. How do I get them? Do I need a broker? Can I do it myself? Right? So there's the whole ordering part, there's the paying part, there's the receiving part, and only at that point right, do I get my product. And so again, I have sometimes managers come up to me and say, Nicola, you talk all about differentiation, and, but you know, I'm in a commodity product. I'm a commodity business. I cannot differentiate my product. And so I usually, okay, I agree. I mean, you're, you're the manager in this, you, you, you probably know best. And indeed, for instance, it's really, really hard to differentiate yourself when you're selling S&P 500 index funds. But by the time I decide to buy the S&P 500 next one from you, there are so many other pain points that you have able to re remove from my life that that's the reason I'm coming to you, not because right, you S&P 500 index fund is the better index fund. Okay. All right. So we can think about these different connected customer experiences that I just talked about as acting on different parts of this customer journey. Right. So the um, Respond to desire starts at the ordering point, right? Because the customer knows exactly what they want, and now respond to desire tries to make the rest of that journey as smooth as possible. The curated offering says, I help you kind of look for options, decide what the best options are for you. The coach behavior says, look, yes, you as a customer are aware once in a while of your needs, but maybe not at optimal times. Let me help you become aware of your needs at more optimal times. And automatic execution says, look, right, I became of aware of your need before you even became aware of it. Let me solve your problem before you even realized it. Okay, so that's connected customer experiences. And so we can basically map our three R's to this journey, right? The first part of the journey is about recognizing the middle part of the journey is about requesting, and the last part is about responding. But at this point, or up to this point, I've really been fairly careful of calling all of these 
connected customer experiences, right? I've interacted with you and had an experience. How do we create now a relationship? And that I think is really important and it comes kind of through this repeat loop because a lot of the things, a lot of these connectivity issues that we've talked about will probably become table stakes and everyone will have them, right? 500 million apps, right? everyone will have one. So how do I create competitive advantage? How do I differentiate myself vis-a-vis -vis my competitors? And I think it will come through this learning loop, right? As I have more and more interactions with you, am I better than you are in learning more about you as a customer so I can become better and better in recognizing, requesting, and responding? And these learning loops, I think, can be really, really powerful because they can be self-reinforcing. So if we have a better fit between the products and needs than our competitors, then that customer is likely to come back to us. And if we are using that opportunity to interact with that customer one more time to learn more about that customer's needs so that we can understand much better what that customer's needs are or help that customer express their needs, then next time I see that customer coming, through the coming to me, I should be even better in fulfilling their needs. Right? And likewise, if we have a better fit between needs and uh, our products and service on offer, we should attract more customers. And if we use now not just learning at the individual level, but learning at the population level, or at least at the segment level, customers like that customer, again, we might be able to create a better product offering, a better service offering. Because it's one thing to know exactly what you need, but then the question is, do I actually have what you need? Right? And again, I can only have a finite number of offerings. So understanding kind of the customer needs will also help us understand what are the kinds of products I need to develop, what are the kinds of products I need to have available. So those are kind of the repeat loops. So this is all on the customer side, on the customer relationship side. Now we're coming to the connected delivery model. Right? How do we create this in an efficient way? And again, we think there are sort of three different elements of it, and uh, I will spend most of my time on the, the first piece, the connection architectures, uh, and then very, very briefly touch on revenue models and the technology infrastructure that sort of makes all of these connected strategies really possible. Now, there's sort of one word that both Christian and I have become now a little bit uh, annoyed with, and that is the word platform, okay? Every company has now a platform strategy, and everyone needs to have a platform or be a platform or... And the problem is that platforms come in so many different shapes and colors and have very fundamentally different business models underlying them that the term platform sometimes just obscures more than it actually illuminates, okay? So let me talk about a whole bunch of different kind of platforms if you want to wish uh, to think about them that way, but we call them connection architectures. So how do you connect the various players in your ecosystem uh, to create these connected delivery models? So. It usually starts out with we having customers, and they're either individuals or companies, right? And there's some information flow between them and the firm. Either it's the customers who are pushing this information in your direction, or you as a firm are sort of you know, automatically hovering above your customer, automatically extracting that information. And if it's the firm who is the main producer of the products and services that the customer needs, right? So the main connection is really back from that firm to that customer, well, we would call that firm a connected producer, right? That's a connected producer connection architecture. So if you think about healthcare systems like you know, our local pen, pen med system, um, you think about um, you know, the Disney example, if you think about uh, Nike or, or uh, Under Armour, uh, right? these are all manufacturers of stuff that try to create a deeper connection with you as a customer. Um, I think video games is an amazing example of companies who over time have become better and better and better in creating customized solutions, right? It used to be everyone pulls off the same cartridge off the shelf, right, and play exactly the same game. Now with online gaming, I can really understand what kind of player are you, how good are you, and I can get you exactly in those kinds of situations that you really enjoy, that are really geared towards your level of play, and so I can keep you in that state of flow, right? Um, now, just as a quick aside on this notion of imitation, right? So that team that developed the magic van for Disney then went on to Carnival Cruises, and so now you go on a Carnival Cruise and you get a little medallion, and that medallion opens up your stateroom and it allows you to know where other people of your party are on the, on the boat, and it allows Carnival to know where people are on the boat and we direct you to, hey, this restaurant is now a little empty or you know, there's still some empty seats in that show or whatever, right? Uh, and now that team has moved on to Universal Studios, so for Universal Parks, now they're creating some kind of wearable. Right? So again, these things will diffuse, right? They will become table stakes. And it's again the question of how do we use this technology to learn more about the customer to differentiate ourselves. So this is all on the willingness to pay side. Now on the cost side, uh, again, there are some interesting plays, right? Uh, progressive automobile insurer says, 
you know, what kind of information do I really want to have in order to price you correctly, right? And if you just tell me the zip code you live in and what car you drive and how old you are, that's really very, very noisy information. What I really want to know is where do you drive, when do you drive, and how do you drive, right? You change lanes frequently, etc. Okay, so let me send you a little device you plug into port of your car. Let me collect that information for three months because that's like, you know, after two days, everyone drives the way they would usually drive. Right? The first two days, they try to game the system, and after that, it's like normal driving. So three months of data is, is plenty. Um, nowadays, of course, you don't need the device anymore. Just download an app because your cell phone has enough sensors on it to, to keep track exactly of that, that information. And now, all of a sudden, right, Progressive is much better able to price you correctly. But also, what is Progressive now able to do? Now Progressive can tell, you know what, I can also tell you of how you could lower your premium. Or let me just rephrase it a little bit. I can make you a better driver. I can help you avoid getting into accidents. And isn't that really what you want? It's not like, you know, pay me quickly if I get in an accident. No, if you can help me avoid accident, well, now that's a different value proposition. I can also tell you how your daughter is driving, by the way, if you want to, right? And so, um, again, all of a sudden, right, new business models open up, right, given that, that information that I have from, from the customers. Um, Daimler, uh, you know, huge car manufacturer, says, hmm, there's a growing segment of the population uh, who don't want to own a car anymore. That's kind of a problem if you're a car manufacturer, right? But these people still need to get from A to B once in a while, and once in a while they need a car, so they just want to rent it for a couple of hours. So why can't I be in that business, right? And so um, Daimler has created the world's largest car sharing service called Car2Go, right, where you can rent a, a, a Daimler product for a few hours with an app on your phone, and that car is parked somewhere outside on the street, right? And so again, it's a connected producer who's now just creating a different connection to their, to their customers. Now, it's not always the case that you are the manufacturer of all the products that your customers want, right? Sometimes there are sort of suppliers there who do that, but you are actively involved in moving the supplies to the customer, right? So that would be Amazon, when you buy stuff from Amazon, that goes through Amazon's warehouse, right? So Amazon is now actively moving kind of that product to you. Uh, it's like Zipcar, right? They didn't produce cars, they basically bought cars and then rented them out in different ways. Uh, that would be my Blue Apron example, right? Uh, I'm basically getting connected to these local farmers, right, through the box of of uh, uh, Blue Apron. In our business, Coursera, edX, right, are platforms that uh, take university-produced courses, right, and then distribute them. A third type of connection architecture, we call a connected market maker. And so now we have information flowing from customers to firms, but firms just direct you to a supplier, but then the supplier deals directly with you, right? So the firm doesn't get in the way of moving stuff from the supplier to you. So this would be the Amazon marketplace. Now, again, right, so you think about, well, this is a platform, but these are fundamentally different types of business models, right? One requires billions of infrastructure investment, and the other one uh, requires a web page, right? And so these are all both platforms, but, but fundamentally different kinds of platforms. Um, now, given that entry barriers in this particular market space was much less because I didn't have to have these billions of dollars of inventory, et cetera, right, uh, there was lots of entry here, and now we see lots of shakeout, right, because it's getting harder and harder to get sort of both sides of the market to join my particular marketplace. The fourth type of connected architecture we call a crowd orchestrator. So again, customers send information to the firm, firm sends you to a supplier, but now the supplier is an individual, right? Rather than existing previous firm, like an airline with Expedia, now we have right, Uber drivers, Airbnb hosts, etc. So there are two big differences between crowd orchestrators and connected market makers. The first one is that the suppliers are now individuals rather than firms, but the, but the second, maybe more fundamental one, is that transactions that happen with connected market makers, very similar transactions would have happened anyways, right? I would have bought some airline ticket without Expedia, maybe not exactly the same one because I didn't have the same information, but a very similar transaction would have happened. Uh, without Uber, it's probably very unlikely that I could just go out on the curb and find someone to drive me from here to the airport for 30 bucks, right? Uh, so crowd orchestrators really create new markets by bringing in individuals as suppliers, right? And so you know kind of the, the plethora of players in, in, in that field uh, in you know, financial services and uh, healthcare, uh, transportation, et cetera. Lastly, right, we have peer-to-peer uh, -peer network creators uh, where we're just basically connecting individuals and it's not completely clear who is the buyer, who is the supplier, right? Or maybe we change our roles very frequently. And for a while the question was, well, how do you make money just connecting people? And so there are at least sort of three different types of uh, business models out there. Uh, the first one we call transaction P2P network creators, right? Uh, so here you either pay 
on a transaction basis. So if I'm on Betfair, I can bet against someone else on a sporting event. I don't bet against the bookie, right? And so now, whenever I do this on that network, right, Betfair charges a little fee, uh, right? Or uh, I will uh, pay a, a fee, a membership fee, right, to be part of that particular uh, network. So uh, kind of a match.com uh, eHarmony would be kind of a part of a, a fee that I pay to be part of that network. Um, second type of network creators are what we call access network creators. So we make it free to join the network, but then we create all this wonderful data and we sell access to that data. And so you know, all the big, big players that we all sort of know uh, have, have that kind of a structure. Uh, and lastly, we have what we would call uh, complementor P2P network creators. So these are companies who create networks peer-to-peer -peer networks in order to sell something else, right? So Nike creates a uh, virtual running club to sell more shoes, right? A healthcare system creates a patient portal to attract potential new patients. All right, now we can put these two things together, right? So I earlier talked about these four different types of connected customer experiences. Then I talked about these five different types of connection architectures. And this gives us now a space to think about, right? Let's call it the connected strategy matrix. Uh, and we found this tool to be really helpful in two different uses. The first use is to just use this to document where are we playing as a company, where are my competitors playing, where are new entrants coming in, right? what kind of connection architecture do they use, what kind of connected customer experience are they trying to create. So that's kind of first just a mapping tool kind of to understand what's happening in my industry. And the second tool is, or the second use of this tool is to say, so what would it mean for us to be in any of these other cells, right? Because usually companies are kind of maybe in one column, um, but asking yourself what would it mean to be in these other cells can be kind of an interesting starting point for an innovation exercise rather than you know, giving someone a blank sheet of paper say innovate, right? Uh, this gives us at least sort of some structure. So if we come back to our example of the um, uh, mobility space, uh, so we can sort of map kind of uh, all of these players. And uh, it's sort of interesting that, that most of these players are in the respond to desire s column, uh, uh, row, right? Um, basically make it really easy for me to get a car uh, right away. Uh, so now we can ask ourselves, so what would it mean, let's say, to be an automatic execution crowd orchestrator? Uh, that might mean, you know, Uber has access to my Outlook calendar and Uber says, look, Nikolai, I know at six o'clock you have a flight, right? from Montreal to Philadelphia, you just step out on the curb and there will be a car waiting for you at 4.30. Uh, and you don't have to tell us actually where you are, whether you are you know, in this hotel or somewhere else, because we know where you are. <laughs> right? now, now again, do I want this? I don't know, but, but that, that would be kind of right, a uh, automatic execution. Now let me briefly talk about revenue models, right? because at the end of the day, we need to make some money. It's not just happy customers, but we want to make some money. Um, but the intriguing thing about having a deeper relationship now with customers and having deeper information flow is that all of a sudden now this possible space or the dimensionality of the pricing space really opens up, right? Uh, we can change what is being paid for. And this is again what we heard this morning, right? We're not just selling you everything up front and we need to extract all of that value in this long-term contract, but maybe we are selling you a service, right? We are selling you power by the hour. Or if we really believe in the, our product, we can maybe have now pay for performance. Um, and saying, because I know how you use the product, and if you don't use it in the right way, well, then my performance guarantee doesn't hold. But if not, then I put my money where my mouth is, and I say, yes, uh, I, I, you, know, you only have to pay if it really performs that well, if it really creates value for you. We can change when the payment is made. Right? I mean, who would spend $360 on a game you play on your phone? You said, oh, no way, right? And here it is right now in the morning, right? You're playing this and oh, for 99 cents, you can buy that magic sword that will allow you to slay that dragon. You say, well, I mean, that, that's okay, right? 99 cents, I just spent 2.99 for my uh, coffee latte, right? And you spend the 99 cents and you're able to slay that dragon. You feel like, wow, great. I've been really productive already this morning, right? I've, <laughs> I've, I've leveled up, right? And now you do this every morning and after a year, you spend $365. And you may not even feel bad about it because every morning it was actually a pleasurable experience, right? So if we can sometimes move the payment closer to the time when people actually create that value and experience that value that our product, our service delivers to them, right, that may be an interesting different way of extracting value, right? Rather than saying, no, no, you'll have a great time with this game, trust me, just pay me $360. That's a much harder sell than, you know, well, here, the game's for free. And then if you really like it and if you want to level up, 99 cents, right? Um, change who is playing, who is paying, right? Uh, 
connect the strategies quite often, and again, we heard this morning this idea about right, these ecosystems, right? We're creating value uh, in, in, in lots of different ways. You know, how can we extract, can we put in, pull in new players who can maybe potentially uh, you know, pay some, some of the, the cost of creating this customer experience? Um, why do customers pay, right? I'm not paying for a shoe, I'm paying to finish my first marathon, right? So if you are able to sort of move up that hierarchy of needs of your customer, that can be very, very powerful. And of course, change the currency at some times, right? Maybe we can, we can pay with data rather than with money. Lastly, technology infrastructure, and of course, this is sort of in some sense, uh, and partly maybe why I'm here, right? Sort of I think AppDirect, right, is sort of one of these companies, right, that starts to allow firms to create these connected strategies, right, and it's in part sort of the answer to the question, why now, right? Why haven't we seen this 15 years ago? Well, because we have seen tremendous improvements, right, in, in technologies. Uh, and uh, so we've just sort of grouped technologies in into a couple of, uh, of, of brackets. Now, of course, this is evolving every day, right? So, uh, but uh, I think there are so four types of different technologies that have really enabled connected strategies to, to move forward. Uh, there are sort of sensing technologies, right, that really allows us to uh, gather data from customers and to really try to understand customer needs, right? And I think I would also put under, under this uh, ways of how customers can interact, right? Voice interfaces, gesture interfaces, right? Different ways for me to express my needs. Um, sensing technologies uh, are really helpful. Um, then kind of, uh, oh yes, they are improving. Uh, here's a healthcare example. The health sensors you built into our smartwatch prototype aren't working. I mean, according to your stupid sensors, my heart is going to stop beating in. Yay me. Okay, so, so they are getting better. Um, uh, then we are fairly low in the technology stack here, right? So we are creating all this wonderful data. Now we need to transmit it somehow without burning our batteries, right? So uh, lots of improvements of moving, moving data across networks at lower, lower energy uh, requirements. Uh, and, uh, you know, we uh, kind of, I would even, even put onto this slide uh, things around blockchain, right? Uh, how do we Im improve the, the veracity of the information that we, that we uh, uh, send back and forth? Uh, then, of course, big improvements in analyzing technology, right? So now I'm getting all of that information, you know, storing it, analyzing it, uh, reacting on it. Uh, and, and lastly, kind of, right, the ability to react, right? Uh, uh, be it through, you know, automation, as we heard this morning, uh, be it through 3D printing, uh, that will probably open up a whole new space of how we can customize uh, our products to, to, to customers. Uh, just one quick uh, uh, example from healthcare. Right, one, again, one, one big problem is that right, pills only come in certain dosage strengths, right? Uh, because again, supply chain, you know, CVS can only have that many different units. Uh, but so you have people, right, cleaving pills apart at home and stuff like that, right? Uh, the other big problem is some people have to take like 20 different medications and it's very easy to get confused. And uh, why can't we just custom print pills that have all the stuff that you need in it in exactly the right dosage, right? And so that's coming down the pike. Uh, maybe more like gummies that you can inject with different kinds of, uh, um, you know, um, uh, 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 pharmaceuticals and drugs. Uh, again, sort of interesting stuff that, that's coming, coming down the pike. So uh, with that, uh, that was sort of a, a whole book in 35 minutes. Um, but, you know, uh, hey, better than reading maybe, I don't know. Uh, two parts, again, as a little, little reminder, right? Two parts of a connected strategy. Um, the connected customer relationship and really thinking about that loop of recognize, request, respond, repeat. And then on the connected delivery model side, right, the architecture, who do we kind of connect with each other in our ecosystem, right? Then how do we make money streams work throughout that whole system, right? And then the underlying technology infrastructure. So, um, thank you very much um, for your uh, attention. Uh, please uh, connect, follow, whatever you like. Uh, and we, I think I have maybe two minutes and 23 seconds for our, our host to come back and ask me a question. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Nicolai. Um, and I just want to ask Nikolai his fun fact question. By the way, if, again, if anyone has any recommendations, throw them my way. But Nikolai, fun yes. fact question for you. If you could be stranded anywhere in the world, where would you be stranded and why? You won't, you won't like, well, maybe you like this answer, you won't like the answer. Okay, try me. New Zealand. Oh, I do like the Kiwi. Okay, fine. good, okay, That's good. Fine. There's, there's yeah. sort of the yeah. Canada-US rivalry between... No, uh, I mean, most, know, for I fun fact, for all of you, we actually try to claim most Kiwis as Australians. Okay. So, we don't right. mind. Uh, so but yeah, why, why New Zealand? Uh, wonderful country. I've spent okay. quite some time there and mm. uh, really love it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, right, well, great. Well, would you thank Nikolai again for me, please? Great, thank you, thank you.